everybody, and welcome to yet another panel here at the Montana Book Festival. My name is Barbara Thoreau, and I'm involved with the Book Festival. I was involved with the library. I love being in this room with all the readers and writers that, <laughs> that have congregated here. We have a panel right now, which I think is going to lead to some interesting discussion amongst two authors. The title is The Necessity and Challenges of Holocaust Narratives. And I hope they talk about some of their challenges with writing what they wrote. Buzzy Jackson, these are the prepared biographies, grew up in the mountains, lived, over the, lived all over the place, and then moved back to the mountains again in Colorado, where she lives with her family and Ralph, a dog. She's the proud daughter of Motor City legend Ruth J. Hall and beloved mystery writer John A. Jackson. And John and family are here. <laughs> Jody Veron is the author of two essay collections, the Your Eyes Will Be My Window is the current one, which we're going to be talking about, and Drawing to an Inside Straight. She's a professor emeritus of English and Writing at Eastern Oregon University, where she established the Low Residency MFA in Creative Writing and served as founding editor of Abaltus, a journal of fine and literary arts. She lives in Missoula, Montana. And I'm going to turn it over to them. And if they run into a dead end, I'll jump in with another question. But I've asked them to talk about writing and some of the challenges and then read from their works. That's good. <laughs> Thanks, Barbara. <laughs> the great Barbara Theroux. Oh, oh, we. Hi, Jody. <laughs> Hello, Jody. <laughs> Hello, Buzzy. Hi. <laughs> I thought I would talk a little bit about the impetus for writing this book, um, and then as I'm talking about that, maybe I'll say a little bit about the challenges, and then do you want to talk about your impetus, and then each of us read, or would sure. you? Okay. That's fine. So. Um, I never heard my grandmother um, say her real maiden name, and I never heard anyone in the family say where the family was from in Ukraine. Um, and so I grew up uh, as a child not knowing anything about any relative who might, have, uh, who might have been in Ukraine during World War II, what happened to them, what happened to the village. Um, it was just, it wasn't a topic ever discussed in my family. And neither was, uh, neither was Germany mentioning Germany, what happened during the war in Germany, even though my father had been in the Army Air Corps during the war. Um, when I was a young mother, one day I was talking to my mother on Sunday night, as, as we always did, and I was describing having picked morels with my family uh, in the mountains above La Grande, where we lived for many years. And it was just, it was such a nice day, uh, such a good harvest. And just out of nowhere, I mean nowhere, the ether, my mother said, Esta Plot sent booby mushrooms from the old country. And it was, and I said, when? And she said, before. And that was it. That was the only, that was it, forever. A few years after that, I was at my aunt's house in Chicago, and she said, you know, the surname of your grandmother, her maiden name, was changed when they came, when they came to the US. And I said, why didn't, why didn't anyone say that? Because by that time, the family had been doing a lot of genealogical research, and it always came up with nothing. Um, my mother denied it. She didn't know anything about it. Bibi is the aunt who, who uh, relayed that information. 
And she said, oh, that BB, you know, she makes up a lot of stories. And a few years after that, we were at a wedding, a family wedding. All the aunties were assembled. Bibi was there. My mother was there. And I said, hey, you know, what about that story? And everyone said, oh, yeah, 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 that's true. <laughs> and then another auntie said, oh, Ratna Gaberna, Ratna Gaberna. That was the name of the village. And that was it. Ratna, Ratna. So that was the impetus for this book. Um, that mysterious, that mysterious uh, Esther plots and booby mushrooms from the old country. Um, but I put it aside because I was working on another book at the time, and I wasn't, uh, I wasn't drawn to writing that part of the family story. And I had been working on another story about my father's family. Um, Fast forward many more years, I had the opportunity to go to Germany to teach in a teacher exchange during my first sabbatical year, which my husband David Axelrod was also a part of during his first sabbatical year. And so we, we went, uh, and we lived in, a, in Ludwigsburg, which is close to Stuttgart, and we taught at the Ludwigsburg University of um, education and continued to do that for 11 successive years, mostly in the summer, usually when we weren't uh, mostly in the summer. So I just want to talk about two other experiences that happened the first time we went to Germany. Um, I was really worried about going to Germany in terms of ta talking to my mother. My father had already passed away. Uh, my mother passed away a few weeks before I left. And so um, I didn't have to tell her that I was going to Germany. Um, but I thought it was really important to go to a synagogue and say the Kaddish for her because Yom Kippur was coming up. And I, I really wanted to do that. Well, Ludwigsburg didn't have a synagogue because it had been burned down during Kristallnacht. And there wasn't a synagogue in the vicinity that was still standing um, because all the synagogues had been burned down during Kristallnacht. But there was a synagogue that was rebuilt in Stuttgart, and so we went there. Um, while we were going, we had to take the train um, from Ludwigsburg to Stuttgart. And to take the train, we walked, uh, we walked around the memorial, the, me the memorial to the burned synagogue <laughs> in Ludwigsburg. And it was such, it was such a gut-wrenching ex experience because the memorial was um, in bad repair. There was trash all over. There was a, an eroded pathway through the middle of it. There was a planting of trees um, in the same configuration of the tree of the Sifarot, which is the, the spiritual essence of God, according to the Kabbalah. All the trees were in standing water. I mean, it was really, it was so depressing. It was just like a kick in the head. Um, after we, after we, we sat on the train, and I couldn't help but weep, we went to the synagogue. Um, and we, David and I were separated, because it was an Orthodox synagogue. Um, and so he was on the main floor of the sanctuary, and I was in the balcony. And I had this sort of amazing exchange with several of the women who were in the balcony. Uh, while on the main floor of the sanctuary, as the service progressed, there was like a singing of all of the names of the concentration camps that had been, um, that all of the names of the concentration camps, camps throughout Europe. And as the as the cantor was singing, there was a man in the back of the sanctuary who was holding an apple that had been studded with needles, like sewing sharps, and he was, he was pressing the needles to his lips. And the people around him were like, oh, you know, stop doing this. You can't do this every year. You have to, you have to stop. There was a scuffle, and he was uh, subdued. His apple was uh, removed, and he was removed from the sanctuary. And I actually I talk about this in my book. What I didn't add is that after he had been removed, he came upstairs to the women's 
balcony, and he, uh, I was sitting next to a woman named Lily, and he said, Lily, I've come for you. And Lily looked at him, and she said, oh my god, you know, <laughs> that Meshuggah man, that crazy man. And then he left, et cetera. Um, and it was those experiences um, in 2005 that made me think that I really needed to return to that. I needed to return to that story. Um, the reason that I bring it up is also because is also because um, everything, all through those 11 years that we were in Germany, the landscape of how to talk about World War II, how to talk about the Holocaust, what uh, what should be done in terms of German reparations, how to build memorials, all that changed. I mean, every time we went back, something had changed. Um, the Synagogue and Plotz Memorial in Ludwigsburg was still pretty scuzzy, um, but a lot of memorials throughout Germany were built. There was a big project 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 called the Stolpersteiner Project um, that started to be established. And so there were little, um, little memorial stones in the sidewalks placed throughout Germany, um, denoting all the places that Jews had lived before they were d deported. Um, the big memorial in Berlin, the, uh, the monument to the murdered Jews of Europe, that was created during that time. And so everything was like constantly shifting. It wasn't until 2014 that the synagogue memorial in Ludwigsburg was redone. And I happened to have been there at the time on another sabbatical um, to, to be part of that um, celebration. And so, so that was like the impetus, all of those, all of those experiences. OK. Yeah. <laughs> I was just saying, since you just spoke so eloquently about your book, maybe just read something from it now, since okay. we have it in our minds. All right. OK. Um, Jody and I also established that uh, we're both Jewish, and my family came from also not too far from where your family is from, right. from Rovno. Yeah. And you're, you, you're Rotna? Rotna. Rotna yeah. and Rovno, right there <laughs> outside of Kiev. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and came over around the same time, around the turn of the, around the early 1900s. Yeah. If you, uh, if, I don't know if you know the writing of Amos Oz, the Israeli artist, uh, the uh, Israeli writer Amos Oz, but he, his family was from Ravno. And when I read his book, I was like, oh, well, how cool it would be to be from Ravno <laughs> instead of Rodno. I actually used some of his stuff in a previous book of mine about my family history. And I was like, thank God Amos Oz came from this town. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Ratna had a famous artist, a famous writer, too, and his name was, um, I mentioned him at the very beginning of my book, and I just had a brain fart. Um, the Canadian poet A.M. Klein was also from Ratna, but he only lived there for one year of his life, and then his family went to Canada. Um, so the, one of the parameters of the book and the reason I talk to you about Ludwigsburg is throughout I'm talking, as I'm looking for Esta Plot or some semblance of some information about Esta Plot, um, we were always living in, we were living in Germany and traveling in Germany and meeting German, um, amazing German people who were very kind and generous towards us. And one of those people was uh, an artist, a visual artist named Christoph Brudy. Um, who became a close friend of ours, he and his wife, um, Haida Brudy. And so I'm reading this section that talks about Christoph Brudy at the beginning. This is from the first chapter called War Artists. Christoph Brudy's father, Walter Brudy, painted a watercolor of a Russian washerwoman in 1942. The precise location of the village where the woman lived isn't identified, though Christoph said his father's wartime letters while he served as a Kriegsmaller or war artist were posted from Russian villages now in eastern Ukraine. And just a tiny little 
tiny little. Um, though Ratna was destroyed in 1942, um, and all of the Jews, except for a few who could escape, uh, were killed. And among those probably was Esteplat. The precise location of the village where the woman lived isn't identified, though Christoph and um, said his father's wartime letters while he served as a Kriegsmaler or war artist were posted from Russian villages now in eastern Ukraine. Deepened in sepia tones, the painting depicts a blocky woman, her head and neck covered with a babushka. She bends over a wash basin atop a barrel, her sleeves push up to her elbows, clothed as though to toil in the cold and mud. Her thick torso is draped in gray, long black skirt brushing the tops of her mud boots. She bends in profile, her eye, nose, and upper lip outlined by her headscarf with its delicate pattern of roses, white patches suggesting illumination, a candle's beam or the moon shining on her head, back, the mound of washing, and the water buckets she used to fill her basin. The background is geometric blocks, swaths of black, smoke, or night, and deep curves define her frame. Represented with brisk rather than detailed strokes, the woman's posture suggests that her task of cleaning a pile of laundry isn't done in haste. My grandmother, Sasha, too, was from a Russian village in the western province of Volin, now in Ukraine. She owned a Westinghouse washer, vintage 1948, boasting a fluid cushion of water and fuses in the motor advertised not to blow. The agitator in the barrel-like drum was vicious, the ringer mounted atop the barrel, responsible for more than one fingertip crushing by older cousins who liked to try to feed cousins' fingers smaller than theirs into the ringer. The machine was so loud and ambulatory, my grandmother usually washed her clothes in the bathtub or on a washboard at the bottom of the summer kitchen steps next to the lilac bush in her backyard. Sasha's Childhood playmate, Esta Plot, had likely grown as portly as the washerwoman in the painting during the 40 years elapsed since she and my grandmother said goodbye to one another when their childhood ended. Esta Plot likely found resilience in the abundant yellows and greens of the sunflower fields for which Ukraine is noted. She likely ate the honey from the bees who worked that pollen. Unlike Sasha, Esteplat did not own a Westinghouse washing machine, though Ratna was electrified during the late 1920s when the Second Polish Republic administered that territory of Ukraine. When Ukraine gained its independence from the former Soviet Union, Ratno became Ratna. Unlike Sasha, Esteplat did not emigrate. This friend and cousin of my grandmother survived two more pogroms in World War I. She married, went to Ratna's makeshift theater with her husband to see the same Yiddish ver version of Hamlet my grandmother and her husband likely saw in Denver, had a business, hired employees. Harvester, harvesters in her employ scoured the forest floor in the northern part of Volin province to search for wild mushrooms, which she dried and shipped to Warsaw, then on to customers in the United States, Argentina, Canada, and Palestine, where many of her Ratna countrymen now lived. My grandmother was one of her customers, and she bought Esteplat's mushrooms as a token from the old country, sent to her alongside Esteplat's letters, which Sasha, Sasha saved just shy of 60 years, in a bundle tied with a frayed yellow ribbon. Not a volum voluminous number of letters lovingly preserved and archived like the war artist letters. Perhaps one or two letters a year, mailed before Rosh Hashanah and again before Purim. Not a lot of mushrooms, just enough to flavor a special bean casserole my mother loved, called chont, that my grandmother served at the conclusion of the holy days of awe. There is no chronicle penned by Esteplat of the magnificence of the golden grains grown in the breadbasket of Eastern Europe so many have tried to rob. There are no bragging rights for Esteplat's braided Sabbath egg wash challah, no scribbled recipe for her chont, no record of whether the forest mushrooms she sold were boletes or chanterelles, 
No observation of whether she clapped her hands in time with klezmer bands or sang like a Yiddish nightingale. She wasn't a union steward or the president of Rotna's first savings and loan bank. She wasn't a teacher in Rotna's first secular school, and she didn't learn to drive a tractor or shingle a roof to prepare for the family's resettlement on a kibbutz near Jerusalem. Neither did she join her fellow Rotners in resettlement in Buenos Aires. She didn't learn the tango. She didn't sit to have her portrait drawn by a famous artist, and her name does not appear in the necrology list of Ratna's Yisker book, its oral history remembrance book of the dead. While sorting through Sasha's possessions in 1965 to move her from the house where she had raised her large family on the west side of Denver to a small apartment on the east side of Denver, I was responsible for sorting the sideboard that housed the family photographs and my mother's Latin and Hebrew primers. My aunts had long since appropriated the valuables in the glassed-in cases above the drawers, crystal candy dishes from Prague and a punch bowl rimmed in gold leaf, the photographs of beauties with lustrous eyes, my great-aunt Clara's scandalous portrait in an off-the-shoulders gown. The image of my dazed and smooth-faced teenage grandparents on their wedding day graces the wall of a Denver kosher-style deli now, and another capturing my great-grandfather bedecked in phylacteries, work clothes, and in his black rubber milking boots is framed and hanging in my cousin's living room. They were the only members of our family to return to visit Ratna, where their tour guide took them to a barn with a Star of David on a ripped piece of wood nailed to a rafter in the hayloft, evidence, the guide said, that Jews had once lived there. <clears throat> Imagine my surprise when I found a bundle of letters in the sideboard drawer in Jewish, as my mother said, that is, in Yiddish, written with the Hebrew alphabet, my grandmother had been whisked out of her house during its last emptying, distracted by cousins with the strawberry sundae at Dairy Queen. But even if she'd been present, her mind was already jumbled, memory fraying at the edges. I hesitated, always wary of my mother's mercurial temper and the menace of her hands. Should I show her the letters, even though she'd made it clear throughout my childhood that she never wanted to discuss any facet of the old country ever? Should I interrupt the argument she was having with her oldest sister in the kitchen? Should I put the letters in the stack I'd started of the few remaining family portraits and hide them until I could decipher them myself? I walked into the kitchen holding the bundle. My mother was pressing a tissue against her right palm, having cut herself on the broken handle of my grandfather's shaving mug. The mug sat, blood smeared, on the tabletop of a page of the Rocky Mountain News. When she saw the yellow ribbon wrapped around the letters, her face went white, then flushed with rage. If I'd looked closer, I would have seen the way the envelopes had dried and wrinkled from all the tears such as shed on them when my mother was a child. If I were clever, I'd have noticed the smudges of ink underneath Sasha's fingernails, no matter how often she scrubbed them. I would have smelled the heavy, waxy odor of her Revlon lipstick, the residue of time and gesture as she pressed her lips to the yellow ribbon that bound the letters. I could know these tangibles of grief, but I couldn't know and shouldn't know what lost world those letters held. As a way to liberate herself finally and forever, my mother said, toss everything, we're throwing out all the useless dreck. The vials of my grandmother's hoarded rose-scented toilet water reverted to alcohol. The costume jewelry with green and red glass jewels chipped or missing from a tiny caravan of dromedary camels, and an elephant like one's Hannibal's army rode over the Alps to Rome. The garbage barrel was nearly full. I tossed the letters on top of the gallon jars of honey we found in Sasha's cellar near the boarded over coal chute. Jars filled with so many ants, the honey looked like amber. When I was still a child, I threw away Esta Platt's letters to my grandmother, the only detailed record of Esta's life. What could a bundle of letters and from the old country contain? What might they mean to our diminished family, shocked and stunned into silence in a time warp that tried every day to erase, to erase every year before 1945? 
What if, at least, as the Plot's letters had survived, like other families' heirlooms? I didn't even think to save the pretty stamps. Thank you. Oh my God, <laughs> so sad. Especially as a historian, I can't. I thought, well, she'll rescue them from the top of the pile. Surely, she'll run out there. That's really beautiful. Um, yeah. Wow. Hard act to follow. Um, it's it's interesting actually to be when I saw the name of the panel that we were going to be on. I thought, as I often do, I didn't write a Holocaust book. Uh, I'm the only person in the world who believes that. Um, but I, that's just to say that I think I sort of backed into writing a book that is about the Holocaust. Um, I, I do uh, review books from time to time. And um, there was a time a few years ago where I was asked to review a big book that was a nonfiction book about um, the Holocaust and about... Um, uh, the experience of French women in the Hol French Jewish women, and so I read this book and I reviewed it. Very good book, very powerful, and so devastating that I felt like, okay, I'm not going to read anything else about the Holocaust for like a year at least. But because I had just published that review, every publisher started getting in touch with me saying, "We noticed that you have an interest in the Holocaust," and I started getting all of these books, you know, sent to me, and um, which I I told them I have to have a year between each book to read them. Um, but then, just a short while later, I found myself uh, on a trip to Amsterdam at the Museum of the Resistance, um, which is was one of the museums in Amsterdam. They have so many, but it was one of the few I felt that I hadn't been to before. And it was in that museum that um, I saw a little display about this young woman named Hani Schaft, um, who's not Jewish, but who had fought for the resistance on behalf of her Jewish friends and uh, Jewish compatriots. And um, I was really struck by this image of her, a young woman, and she had become an assassin of Nazi officers. It seemed so dramatic. And my first thought was, well, um, I'm going to go to the bookstore on my way out of the museum and pick up the book about Hani Schaft that must be there. And there was no book there. And I was pretty shocked, because Hani Schaft, uh, who is the, the hero of my book, um, she is pretty well known in the Netherlands. I would say she's her name is one of those names that, that many Dutch people know, even if they don't exactly know why they know it. But there are some schools named after her, streets, stuff like that. But uh, there really hadn't been a good biography or any biography written of her since um, the 1970s, which was pretty st startling to me. So I resolved to write this book about this amazing young woman in the Dutch resistance. And um, my background being in history, I thought I'll write a biography, a straight ahead nonfiction biography of this young woman. And I started doing the research. And after about a year of researching, um, I should have known it was a book about the Holocaust when the first archive I went to was the Institute of Genocide in <laughs> Amsterdam. Um, I found that there's a lot of great archival material about the Second World War, of course, in, in the Netherlands, uh, which was occupied by the Germans from May 1940 until the very end of May 1945. Um, and, but there really wasn't that much from uh, in Hani's own voice. And it, I started to realize that probably the reason Anne Frank is you know, the best known sort of symbol of what happened in, in the Netherlands during the war, um, it's because she wrote that diary. That's the only reason we know who Anne Frank is or her story or know anything about her family. And uh, most people don't leave diaries behind, and Hani Schaaf did not either. And at that point, um, it was actually my literary agent who suggested I think about writing it as a novel. And I was hesitant, very hesitant, because um, for one, I felt, I think because of my background in history, I just felt sort of a responsibility to the real people. I thought, I can't just 
make up their lives. You know, that's not what historians do. But then, um, but then I kept thinking about it. And I thought, you know, if there's even going to be a single line of dialogue in this entire book, I'm going to have to make it up because how else am I going to, you know, find it? Uh, there were a few letters from Hani Shaf that survived, and there's a few things from her um, high school years, some essays. Um, and I would say probably every single, not every single direct quote, but almost every quote she ever left behind is somewhere in this book. I found a way to put it in there, including the title is a, is part of a quote from Hani Shaf, um, who told her, her colleague in the resistance, she was getting ready to go out to go try to kill another Nazi and um, was putting on her lipstick and making herself look all pretty so she could kind of maybe seduce one of these guys and get him to walk down the alley with her before she shot him point blank, and um, which she did. <laughs> and she did later that night. Um, and her friend, who was going to be doing the same thing with her, said, come on, we are going to be late. And she said, listen, Truce, if I die tonight, I'm going to die beautiful. And that, so that's where the title came from. So that was, you know, I'm trying to wedge these direct quotes in wherever I could. It was her friend who, who recorded that later in her memoir about that line. Um, and so, and then finally, I guess I got the courage to actually just go for it as a novel for two reasons. One, because I just thought her story was so incredible, this young woman who basically risked everything to help her two Jewish best friends and uh, was just an incredible hero. Um, and two, I remembered a book that I often think of as a nonfiction book, and I think a lot of people do, um, Schindler's List, ever heard of it, um, and, but it's a novel. It's a novel that's based on the true story of Oscar Schindler, and thank God God, Thomas Kennelly, the author of Schindler's List, when it first came out around like 1980, he wrote a, a author's note in the beginning of that book, and it's still in, I think, most of the printings today, um, explaining why he chose to write Schindler's List as a novel. And basically, he addressed every single concern that I had myself about doing it, which was, these were real people that these horrible things happened to, you know, you don't want to take that lightly or fictionalize it in some way. Um, you know, what if you get something wrong? What if blah, blah, blah? But ultimately, he also came around to the feeling that this particular story was too important not to try and put down somewhere and ideally in a way that people would actually like to read it, um, not just like a dry monograph or something that nobody would read. And um, which really hit me because, you know, since the time Schindler's List was, was written and since the film, and actually because in many ways, because of that book and film and the popularity of it, you know, we now have the Shoah Foundation, in, which is housed at USC Film School, and where there's tens of thousands of hours of oral histories have been recorded of Jews you know, who survived the Holocaust, other people from the Holocaust as well, not just Jewish people. And so we have tens of thousands of hours of first person experience of the Holocaust, but who among us is going to sit there and listen to 10 hours of somebody's oral history? It, it does take some storytelling, um, you know, some kind of, um, some kind of, storyteller to come in and shape it, even in a nonfiction way, for us to actually access all of that information. So it made me feel like, OK, I have permission from Thomas Kennelly, RIP, um, to write this book. Um, and so I did. And I also tried to do what he tried to do, which is basically the story itself is so incredible that there was really nothing much I had to add to it because her own life story was so incredibly dramatic. Um, but of course, I did have to add dialogue. That was the whole point. And um, so I thought I would just, you know, this book is about 420 pages, which is a lot longer than I thought I would ever write a book. Um, but I, but it's actually even shorter than the original manuscript. And there's so much of Hani's life and of this period that got cut out of the book uh, or never even made it in just simply because there's not enough room and nobody has the patience, including me. Um, 
so I really tried to make sure I focused on the events that were um, real, <laughs> that were documented, and um, and then try to put myself in the position of these people and you know how they must have felt. Um, I think it is one of my real, you know, I think as a historian, I guess one of my my sort of beliefs or an ethos that I have is that people are the same no matter when in history we have lived. We live in different times and cultures and different influences, but I don't personally believe that people who lived in ancient Rome were any essentially any different than we are now, or people who lived, you know, 200 years ago. Um, we certainly haven't changed physiologically. Uh, so I, I don't, th I think it is a, an important thing to use our imaginations to try to project ourselves back into the past in, a, in order to understand it. Um, they're just people just like us. Um, so I'm picked, Two sections. I don't know if we'll read both of them, but I'll, both of them are um, sections that are well documented um, events or things going on at the time that I then sort of used in a way for the novel. So this is just a short passage from this is before Hani, who's a college student uh, when this is happening. She's a law student at the University of Amsterdam. And she has two uh, Jewish best friends, um, Sonia and Feline. Hold on for just a second. I got to get my reading glasses here. Um, and, you know, as far as I know, these are really the only Jewish people that Hani had ever known closely. I mean, she grew up in Harlem, right outside of Amsterdam, um, from definitely a socially progressive family and fairly politically involved, but not radical by any means. Uh, her dad was in the teachers' union, and her mom belonged to a very progressive um, Christian church that... Uh, started ordaining female ministers in 1905, to give you some idea of how progressive <laughs> the Dutch can be in certain ways. Um, so, but she just, I think my my feeling about what happened to Hani and how she got so radicalized so quickly was that she simply just met these two young women. They became the closest friends she had ever had. And then she started to see her life and their life go in completely different directions because she was not Jewish and they were. For instance, they were kicked out of law school for being Jewish. She she was able to continue in law school, so she would teach them the classes after school that they were missing, you know. And I think it just outraged her. And in the really beautiful way that I think young people especially can really stick up, you know, stand up for what they believe in, she just thought, screw this, this is, this will not stand, you know, and that's where she's coming from. So this first section is just about, um, I had read in a memoir by one of her friends that they went at some point to go see a fortune teller. And I, like you, there's like little shreds of information, you know, that you get. I have no, that's all I know about that trip to the fortune teller. I don't know what they said. I don't know, you know, why they went, but I thought, oh, this is a great thing for a novelist to go to a fortune teller. So, um, so this is her going to fortune teller. And what I decided to do was combine, um, this trip to the fortune teller with us in a setting, another real setting that I knew I wanted to include in the book, which was, uh, a place that's now, um, it's now a museum in Amsterdam and it's, it's called the Jewish Theater, the Sha and uh, it's known as the Schauberg. And um, you'll kind of, I, I think you'll see what's going on at this theater as I read this, but I can also explain afterwards. It was important to me to try to set a scene here, though, because it's such a stark, um, sort of scary moment. This is in a moment in 19, around 1943 when the Germans were very slowly putting in anti-Jewish measures in throughout the country. And unlike in Poland, a lot of places with like Kristallnacht, like you, you mentioned, in the Netherlands, it was very, um, there was a totally different strategy on the part of the, of the Germans who were, who were um, occupying. They basically felt like, if we can do this slowly over time, get all the Jews out quietly, 
we won't outrage the rest of the populace, and these Dutch people, who are basically just Germans, in their mind, don't ever say that to a Dutch person, <laughs> They, you know, they'll come around and become part of our greater Volk, you know, the German Volk, and then and we'll like quietly get rid of all the Jews there. And actually, this strategy worked uh, rather well. They, um, it's kind of like the metaphor of like the frog boiling in the pot slowly. You know, by the time you realize it's too late, it really is too late. Um, and so that's kind of what's happening at this point is. Um, people are disappearing off the streets. Uh, people are being kicked out of their jobs for being Jewish. There's curfews being imposed. Uh, Jews can no longer ride bicycles or public transportation. Um, but these things are coming in over time. So, uh, so this is when Hani and her two Jewish friends, Sonia and Feline, uh, go to the fortune teller in Amsterdam. <coughs> um, Let's see. Although it was a short ride there, not more than 15 minutes, the difference between Feline's Jewish neighborhood and the Plantage neighborhood was stark. Vanished was the formerly verdant little island of botanical gardens and lush public parks. As soon as I crossed the bridge, the barometric pressure seemed to drop. A heaviness permeated the air as clumps of soldiers clustered at every street corner. Eyeing me and the few other passers-by with suspicion, their eyes lingering on the left shoulder of my coat in search of a yellow star. From a block away, I recognized the familiar arched doorway of the Grand Italianate Theater. A few old posters for an orchestra concert, by and for Jews only, still hung in the box office windows. A few German soldiers stood out front. I swung my bike in a detour, taking the long way to, to the address around the opposite side of the block from the theater. Madame Seja lived on the fourth floor of a tall apartment building that appeared relatively untouched by the occupation so far. Its limestone facade was still smooth and white and the welcoming front stoop neatly swept. I let myself inside and waited outside the elevator for a minute, listening to it clanking laboriously somewhere above me. I decided to take the stairs. At each landing, a long narrow window allowed light in from the interior courtyard beyond. I could hear people outside, but I didn't stop to observe, taking the stairs two at a time in search of my friends. I flung open the door to the fourth floor. Hani, Sonia's bright voice sung out from the end of the hallway and she clapped her hands. How did you find us? Feline hugged me too, tightly. I knew she got nervous being out on the streets for very long these days. Have you seen her yet? I asked, hoping they were already ready to go home. No, she's getting prepared, said Sonia, walking me down to Madame Sage's apartment. It was a plain wooden door like all the other ones except Madame Seja's had a small totem, a glass trinket that looked like an eye, tacked to the upper corner of her doorway. It wards off evil, said Feline, supposedly. And I'm just going to skip ahead a little bit in the same scene. Um, let's see. So Hani does go in to get her palm read. Um, and let me see. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, so she's, she's sort of t telling her about her life. Hani's kind of skeptical. But Hani is distracted once again by the sound of these people talking in this interior courtyard uh, of the building. Um, from where I sat, I had a view of the block's interior courtyard. And once again, I heard voices coming from down below. I squinted, trying to get a better view. What's going on down there? Madame Seja's face darkened, but she pulled back the curtain to give me a better look. Below us, the empty space in the middle of the block was divided into quadrants. Three of the four featured the usual array of small gardens, clotheslines, the domestic features of a crowded city, a humbler but similar tableau to the one behind Sonia's house. But in the fourth quadrant, something else was unfolding. The space was gray and devoid of greenery or decoration of any kind, just a cement square filled with people, adult men and women, huddled together in small groups and talking, some arguing, others barely moving, leaning against the walls where they could. It was overcrowded. Tension hovered in the air like electricity. Is that behind the, I saw the peaked white roof of the building? The theater, I asked. She nodded, staring down at the crowd with me. A few people looked up at the windows of the apartments, but I doubted they could see in. They're changing the name again, Madame Seja said, watching with me. Some soldiers delivered the signs a few days ago, but they haven't put them up yet. Overslagpunt. 
They're not pretending it's a theater anymore. Overslog point meant shipping depot. They're Jews, I said, looking at the people below. She nodded. They're being deported, I asked stupidly. The words felt sticky in my throat. So it would seem, she said. We looked down at the open air prison like children watching ants trapped in a jar, tracking them as they milled about in the confines of the small space, clearly nervous yet trying to remain calm. The theater had been a stage not only for musicians, but also for the proud citizens of Amsterdam who attended in their finest gowns and top coats, bejeweled women and men wearing shiny shoes. Now the people below wore layers of unmatched clothing to stay warm in the shaded courtyard, their bare heads covered only by matted hair, faces dull with anxiety. Can't we do anything, I asked, scanning the interior of the buildings for fire escapes or anything else one could use for a ladder to go down and reach them? or for them to climb up to us. But the interior walls had been scoured bare, and I realized anyone dropping a rope down would be doing so in full view of scores of office and apartment windows and the invisible omnipresence of dozens of not so neighborly strangers who might earn a reward for describing what they saw. The imprisoned people below collected there like the last drops of water at the bottom of an abandoned well. They've been moving Jews in and out of here for months, Madame Seja said. There are hundreds more inside the theater. They take turns going inside and out. She gestured toward the hundreds of other windows surrounding the courtyard. The neighbors here drop things down sometimes, she said, but only at night when the guards can't see. Otherwise, I finally noticed the guards. They stood in small groups at the corners of the concrete square, guns slung along their shoulders and hips. They arrest anyone who tries to intervene, she said. I followed her gaze to a window across the courtyard, its glass smashed into jagged teeth, the apartment behind it presumably emptied. Um, let's see, I leaned on the table for support as I clasped her papery hand in my own. They have to get, they have to get out. She raised an eyebrow. They're trapped, she said, prepared to admit that even her talents, whatever they were, could not help the people held below. Not them, I whispered. I pointed to the front door of her apartment beyond which stood my friends. Madam Seja's expression changed. They are your sisters? Yes, I said, like sisters. They're my friends. <clears throat> how, uh, how old are you, honey? 22, I answered. She smiled. You were born into troubled times, she said. There's only one thing you can do. What, I whispered, hoping there were a spell she could cast or a magical amulet. In this moment, I was willing to put my faith in anything. She leaned forward and placed the cigarette she'd rolled into the center of my palm, closing my fingers around it. Be brave. So that's the end of that section. And that section, <laughs> that courtyard, I really wanted to write about because you can still go to that courtyard today. And I went there on one of my research trips. And I just remember you go into this old theater, beautiful old theater. Um, there's you know, pictures of the theater before and after the war, before and during the war. And then you go out to the courtyard. And it really is just one of those courtyards that you find in big, big cities, you know, the middle of a city block. And um, they haven't done anything to it. It's just a cement square. Um, but there's photos hanging on the sides of many of the people who passed through that place. Um, they were sent from here to um, one of the two concentration camps that were in the Netherlands during World War II, which I never knew there were concentration camps in the Netherlands before I started doing this book. Um, so they were sent from there and then usually on to other concentration camps further east. Um, but when you stand in this cement square, I mean, you cannot help but just uh, like immediately understand that you have hundreds of witnesses to what is happening right there. And just the thought of, <laughs> like both the thought of obviously of being a person is stuck in that square is so horrible, but also the thought of being one of those people up in the windows staring down at them is so horrible. And it's such a, I just thought it was such a like apt metaphor for, you know, being alive 
right now even, you know, and knowing about the horrors that we actually see, you know, we, they're not hidden from us. We see them on our screens, you know, we see them wherever. Um, and that was what was so, in, I think that's the sort of Holocaust that I ended up writing about was kind of the slow moving realization in a civilization that everything is turning for the worse and at what point do you just decide to try to do something um, about it um, so yeah so that that, that was that section <laughs> 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 Woo um, but yeah but so I guess that's to say too that um, I don't know if Hani Shoft actually ever went to an apartment overlooking the Schauberg theater she probably didn't but I felt I felt okay putting this scene in there because I know lots of other people just like Hani Shoft had that experience. And I thought it was such an important sort of site of the, the Dutch Holocaust. Um, which I should say, another thing I learned writing this book is that, um, you know, the Netherlands went very quickly from being one of the safest places in the world for Jews to live, where it had been for hundreds of years, one of the most tolerant societies. Um, to actually, um, aside from Germany, um, amongst all Western European occupied countries, it was the worst place to be a Jew. 75% of the Jewish population was killed, which is a higher percentage than any other Western occupied, West, Western Europe occupied country besides Germany. Um, and so it's, uh, you know, it's, it's also that fear of like, the the speed at which some a place can change you know that part of it was very uh powerful for me and and scary which is why when i showed this manuscript to my mom uh finally she said oh my god honey i can't believe you spent the whole pandemic with material this depressing <laughs> i said i know <laughs> But anyway, um, yeah, so that was, you know, that's just an example of kind of trying to weave something real with something, you know, things that are real and but put it in a way that people can relate to, you know, which I'm sure you did as well. Yeah. <clears throat> I, uh, I mean, we talked about this, we talked about this topic before the start of the panel, and I think that, um, when I originally went to Germany in 2005 and started recording um, events and thoughts, feelings, etc., I had imagined that I would write a novel as well um, for a lot of the same reasons that I didn't. I mean, I had so little information. Like, I had next to no information. Like, I had a sentence of information. But I could never, I could never imagine the right the right narrative voice to, to, to tell this story or the right character who, who, would embody, who would embody that voice because it was always me, right? And I just, I couldn't, I couldn't move away from that idea. Um, and then all of, these, all of these things in the world started to happen. All of these archives opened, all this material mysteriously appeared, um, all of these memorials, all this dialogue. Um, and then I discovered a kind of a treasure trove of information in um, these memorial books that a lot of the little Stettlach had put together after the war because people who had emigrated before World War II, a lot of them congregated in or around Palestine in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and they started to write down whatever whatever information they could remember in these memorial books for the dead. And I found the memorial book for the dead um, for Ratna when I was, I was a reader at the British Library for a month in 20, 2014. And it was so, it was mind boggling. I mean, there was information about Ratna at the turn of the century, Ratna in the in the 10s, the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, up to the time of the Holocaust. And so I was able to put, I was able to piece together a lot of information that, um, 
that was implied in that one sentence about the mushrooms, about Esta plot, et cetera, et cetera. And so a lot of the a lot of the the real feeling of the book, the real information of the book was based on those oral stories. But they are oral stories. And so as a historian, I'm sure you have talked about the, the difference between ethnographic material and archival information. Um, but I also had the experience of watching the information in archives shift over that, enti that entire period of time that I wrote this book. And so material would be up online, it would disappear, it would be retranslated, it would, it would you know, just crazy. It was a crazy experience in that way. Things that were supposedly burned or lost were suddenly showing up in archives in the US, in Ukraine, um, in Germany. Um, and all of these amazing things started happening in Ludwigsburg to, to honor the, the Jewish community who had, who had vanished from there. So I felt, I started gradually to feel like, like I, I could do this. As a, as a creative nonfiction exercise. And I could use the essay form, which is a form I feel much more comfortable with, as opposed to writing fiction, even though I taught fiction writing for 32 <laughs> years. Um, as a writer myself, I just have felt, I have felt more comfortable in the essay form. Yeah. It's interesting what you say about the, um, like what voice to write it in, because uh, I initially wrote, most of this book in the like close third person and i and i just never felt like it was really clicking and then i started i said i'll write the rewrite the first chapter in first person and just see and the second i started doing that i could just tell it was so much better like it just clicked for me but it was also such a um sort of uh a leap, you know, to to put myself in the voice of the protagonist of this book, this real woman. Um, if I can quote my father, John Jackson, uh, who has been very uh, kind in his words about this book, one of the things I do remember you saying to me, Dad, is, how did you get the gall to write <laughs> in the first person? <laughs> But it's really, that is the word. That is the word. And I knew exactly what he meant, because that's how I felt thinking about, am I really going to do this? You know, am I really going to write in her voice? Um, but I felt for the readability of the book, it just it just came through more. And I think the emotion and the feeling came through more. So I rewrote the entire fucking book in first person. And, um, and the, the funny thing is, and the joke's on me, um, I'm working on a new novel now, and I just rewrote that one in the first person, too. So, you know, maybe one day I'll learn my lesson to just start in the first person, but at least, you know, it's another round of revision. It can't hurt. Yeah, it can't hurt. That's amazing, though, about those memory books. And it makes me think, too, that my grandmother emigrated from Rovno um, to Detroit in, in, in around 1914. And if you go to the cemetery in Detroit where she's buried, it's like the entire population of Rovna is buried in this in this Detroit cemetery. It's an area, obviously, like they designed it that way, that all of these people who grew up in the same little shtetl, um, they all have the same birthplace in this one area of, of just downtown Detroit at this point, and it's really moving and powerful to see it, you know? It just the transplantation of an entire community. Um, it's wild, yeah. I was thinking, uh, as you were talking just now, about the the voice of the, uh, the first person voice. And, and I, I think that um, because this project started so long ago, um, and because so much time has passed, there have been so many iterations and so many, so many different um, points of contact. Um, when I first started working on this book, I, I felt like I couldn't understand who my grandmother might have been because I only knew her as a child, knows her grandmother. But over time, I mean, I have become a grandmother, and so I'm a booby too. 
And um, I think that I think that the the core of the book that is this book, the draft that is this book, was written after I became a grandmother. And um, I think that I think that those that pers that perspective I think is probably pretty unusual for a book. I mean, Caroline, I know you took a long time to write your book, but but I mean. I didn't have the pre I didn't I felt like I didn't have the pressure to hurry this book along and so I and I wouldn't say I took my time on purpose but it so happened that I took a lot of time to write this book and in doing so so many things changed in the world and as a um, as an example like I wrote the prologue to the book at the very end of the at the very end of the exercise, and uh, as I was writing the prologue, the the insurrection happened on you know on January 6, 2021, and I was trying to I was trying to articulate just that question that's the the, the title of this talk. You know, why do we still talk about why are we still talking about the Holocaust? And and listening to the I would listen to in to the insurrection on the radio. I mean, I was listening to Montana public radio as we were driving home from skiing on Lolo Pass, and it was like, Jesus, I mean, is this, what's going to, we didn't, no one knew what was going to happen, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it just, it just seemed like the same pattern being repeated again. I mean, these fantastical lies, this really sort of bare and, desperate grab for power, um, the kind of what you were talking about, just sort of watching, you know, watching from some fantastical or, or close focus perspective as people get shipped away, you know, as neighbors disappear and not really knowing what to do or when to do it or how to do it. I mean, I thought everything seemed really current. Um, I, um, I had a similar experience in that when I f the first went to the museum and found out about Hani Shaft for the first time, it was December of 2016, right after Trump was elected, right after the Brexit vote, and, uh, I was feeling pretty bummed out at that point, and, but I do remember in sort of the early part of 2017 thinking, I gotta write this book while it's still relevant. You know, and seven years later, it's still relevant. So, hooray! Um, but yeah, but anyway, I, I, it's yeah, it's weird how that happens for sure. Um, Would anybody like to ask either of us a question or Barbara a question? She's right here. My dad's here. Yeah, my dev, my brother Devin's. Yeah, hi. Yes. Hello. Um, this question's not fully formed in my head yet, but it's a continuation of what you're talking about. Um, something that uh, I've been grappling with for a uh, few years now is this universalizing of the Holocaust that we see so often, um, and this idea of uh, what's the lesson to be learned here for others, right? But you're both dealing with specific people and you have background as a historian, but you're also dealing with the story of a member of the righteous. So I'm curious if you can talk a bit about like you are grappling with that when you're dealing with these narratives of like, yes, there are lessons to be learned here, but that's not the point. And like, how do you not lose sight of the specifics and the details? Okay. Um, yeah, I think, uh, well, Clearly, the way I dealt with it is by not even realizing I was writing about the Holocaust. Um, no, but I think, um, I do think that there is a little bit of, um, like, the word, the Holocaust can just stand in for, like, you know, what, what could happen if everything goes wrong? You know, what human beings are capable of, that kind of thing. But I do think that... Um, it is so important to actually tell these individual stories of, of individual people, wherever they are. You know, in this case, um, I kind of touched on it earlier, but the Dutch experience of the war, it 
for Jews there, it was really different than for Jews in other parts of Europe. Um, partly, as I said, because of um, uh, because of the way that the anti-Semitic measures were implemented uh, was was really markedly different than a lot of places. Um, but also because a lot of the Jews who were in the Netherlands by 1940 were already refugees. They were already refugees of Germany, many of them. And Frank's family, for example, they were German. They had lived in the Netherlands for, I don't know, seven, ten years, something like that, before uh, before World War II. Um, so a lot of these people thought they had already escaped the worst. And I do think stories like that are really, um, to me, what it, it brought up a lot is, I think, a question that a lot of American Jews and probably um, anyone in a diaspora from any kind of horrible genocide in their country has is, um, would I have known when it was time to leave? You know, would I have realized, like, in time? Because that's such a classic feeling you have of, like, why don't they just leave? You know, you're reading this thing. It's 1938, people. Like, get out of there. But, of course, they don't know. And, um, you know, just even reading that kind of story, I think, is, like, a helpful or just an interesting thing to think about for anyone today, you know, wherever they live, you know. Um, so, yeah, every single story of the Holocaust is is individual and unique, you know, and I do think that... Um, we can't just let Anne Frank be the only per the only story that we know of. Um, there's many, many more. Um, do you want to say anything about that? I, kind of, I just was thinking about, uh, we recently saw a, a film called um, Three Minutes, A Lengthening. We, it, was, it, it showed at the Roxy. Um, Zootown Jews had um, sponsored the showing of the film, and it it's uh, so the film the the film three minutes a lengthening is about a, fa a footage that was found um, in the author of this at, at first it was a nonfiction book uh, it was found in the author's possession maybe it was from the grandfather's so it was from a grandfather's trip who and and he and his grandmother had gone. I mean, it's kind of mind-boggling to think about, because I think they went to Europe in 1938. I don't know why they did that, but as American Jews, they went to, they went on the grand tour. You know, like they went to Europe, they went to Switzerland. Uh, they were also in their home village. And in all of this footage of the, of the grand tour, there's a three-minute section, segment, of them going to, I can't remember where the village is, but uh, they go to the village and there's a segment of all of the townspeople coming out of the synagogue. And the whole, and the film, which is like an hour and a half, just continues to re replay that footage of the people coming out of the synagogue, the people walking down the street, there were a couple of people from the village who were children at the time, and they survived. You know, they survived the Holocaust, and so the filmmaker was able to talk to them, talk to the families. But watching it was um, miraculous uh, and agonizing at the same time because um, everyone looked so happy, everyone looked so healthy, everyone looked so part of a of a community. And so I think that, but I thought that the beauty of the film was about how each of the, each of the characters, because you know by the end of the film who had survived, you know, they seemed like real people. They seemed like flesh and blood human beings. And so I think that it's important to um, I think it's important to really vivify individuals because, at least for me, I just I just can't grasp I just can't grasp the magnitude of the Holocaust just looking at numbers. Um, even though you know to know that that peop a, a town the size of Missoula could be could be wiped out in in a few days of concentrated killing, um, it just doesn't have the same. 
it just doesn't, I, just for me, it doesn't connect me to humanity in the way that knowing about individuals and individual stories does. Yeah. because I'm probably going to have to stop it because there's going to be another panel in here in another 10 minutes. So, But I want to thank everybody for being here. Both of these books are available out there at the book table. You have Fact and Fiction, sold by Fact and Fiction. <laughs> and thank you for supporting the Montana Book Festival and for being here today. We'll be back. We'll be back next year, I promise. <laughs>